And now, here's your host of Shaping Success, Wes Tankersley. What is up, everyone? Welcome to Shaping Success. I'm your host, Wes Tankersley. Thanks for hanging out for us with another episode. Um, in a few minutes here, we're going to bring Mark England back on. He was a guest a couple episodes ago, and we had a really great conversation. Just super interesting to me, words and, and how they affect you and the things that you can do to propel yourself and push yourself forward. And I think that's what Shaping Success is about. Um, before we get started, thank you to our Patreon, Nikki Pavlovich. Just so you guys know, our last episode, which will be coming out, you'll be, well, if you hear this when it's a week old, if you join the Patreon, you can hear a little um, after show conversation I had with Megan. Awesome information. And for as little as $4 a month, you can support the show and get in on that bonus content. We're going to do the same thing with Mark. He's allowed us to do that. So when we get done, we'll have a little talk after and that will be uploaded to Patreon only. So that's one of those benefits that you get. Without further ado, let's get Mark in the house. Mark, good to have you back. Good to be back, Wes. Man, it's, uh, you know, we, we got done last time and I didn't have as much time as I wanted to have. So, you know, I thought this would be an awesome second conversation about things and interviewing some of your coaches and kind of getting to go through that and know a little bit more about what's going on with Lifted is just, it's just awesome, man. Who, 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 who'd, who'd you get? You got uh, Megan Henry. Yep. Former uh, Olympic uh, uh, skeleton racer. Yep. That's 80 miles an hour. Man, she is head first by yourself. She's she a beast. Is very passionate about sports and athletics. And she's got me really, she's got me really, I haven't talked to her about it, but she's got me really thinking about like, you know, that, that life is a former athlete, right? Like to be in the middle of that, to be living that, the things that you tell yourself as you get older that you can't do. And, and, um, it's inspiring. I mean, I, I read, listen to, I listen to, I listen to books, but David Goggins, you know, kind of the same mentality. It's like, what is holding you back? It's like, it's between your ears. Right. And, and you, the things you tell yourself and it's crazy. And I mean, what's more seductive than that voice, man, what's more seductive and easy to believe than, than our own voice in our own head. Hey, it's my own voice in my own head. It must be accurate. It must be right. It must have my best interest in mind. Right. One of the clips that I posted about our interview too, which, um, you know, that was out last week was when, when you were talking about how no one talks more shit to yourself than yourself. Like that, that is like solid gold right there. Like, I feel like Dude. We, we, it's, it is, it's the truth, right? Like that's, we're the biggest problem. We just shit all over ourselves <laughs> and, and, and wake up and do it the next day. I was talking to, um, I did a, uh, hour long workshop on words and stories and mindset yesterday for 20 CrossFit coaches. Um, and, and I said the exact same thing because I say the exact same thing almost every time, you know, change it up a little bit here and there. And then also once that baseline conversation has been established, then we can go off in a variety of different directions, which was uh, and, and have other kinds of fun, uh, which was one of the reasons I, I wanted to come back on your show, man. That was so much yeah. fun talking to you. I was like, I want to do that again with him and and we'll we, we can do some other stuff. And and so that, you know, that I had the base base, the the fundamental conversation with those coaches yesterday morning. And I said that exact same thing. I said, you know, who talks more shit to you than you? It's not even a close second. It's not even, there's, it's not, it's not a remotely close second. And somebody says something to us once that kind of resembles the thing that we've been secretly whispering to ourselves all throughout the days and weeks and months and years and even decades. Nobody ever talked to you. And what do you, well, what do you got to, you'll never be able to, and somebody says something remotely close to that to us once and we explode. And, and now yeah. they're the villain. Right. Exactly. And that's the thing. It's like that judgment that you get that you've created in your own head. Like you've, you've made the judgment on yourself, you know, and now that's that you've made that judgment on yourself, it's really easy when someone judges you for the same thing to get really upset about it. Yeah. They just reach in there and they, they hit that nerve. Yep. <laughs> Something that one of that Brandon and I talked about too, which was a great conversation as well. He said that you introduced him to something called a wins journal. Correct. 
Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Because I, I'm, I, I got to do like, the, here's the thing. The action part is the thing, right? You got to do that. So I'm, I'm about, I was out there. I need to go to the store. And the next time I go to the store, I'm going to grab a couple composition notebooks and, and my daughter and I are going to do this and I'm going to do it as well. Like we're, she's going to do it. I'm going to do it. How is, how powerful is that? It's, it's tremendous. It's absolutely tremendously valuable and powerful and easy. And in a short amount of time, she will be your accountability buddy. The best one, the, 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 it's I, pff, level two class on Monday night. We have got group 10. Um, so a, a couple of the people in there have children and they implemented the wins journal and they do it. Okay. So here's, here's the wins journal and the, the ages for kids, it'll work at 35, 65, whatever. And for kids, it's, it's five to 12. Mm -hmm. Okay. Five to 12. And what you want to do is, is you make it super simple. You just exactly right. Go get a composition notebook. This is, this is, this is, this is a teacher thing in there, right? Like that's, that's, that's the, Hey, here, here's one of these composition notebooks. That's, that's where it comes from. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And then one win per day per page, right in the middle of the page and, and, and write it out in a couple of full sentences. So half sentences, it's, it's, it, it's the same principle for the stuck stuff, which I'm assuming that we'll get into today, what to do with stuck stories. It's the same thing for our wins for the stuck stuff, the stories of ouch and pain and sting and woe that, um, most people, and that's generous, keep up here in their head. This is where most people keep their stories of ouch and pain and sting and woe. And I know why they're, they're trying not to bump up into those feelings and emotions, which is what happens when we put pen to paper and it starts to summon up those feelings and emotions again. Right. Um, even though it's smoldering while it's in there. Right. Yeah. Cause that's the thing about stories, negative stories. They burn going in. They smolder while they're in there, and then they burn coming out. Yeah. And if you just like a spicy Thai dish, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, everybody, <laughs> go down to your local Thai restaurant and get it Thai hot, not what's on the menu, Thai <laughs> hot, and message me in 48 hours, assuming that everything's working correctly, and you'll have a good idea of of the mechanics of these stories of ouch and pain and sting and woe. 48 hours ought to get it cleared out so that you can actually talk about it. Right. (laughs) Correct. I, you know, that's, it's, it's a good, it's a good timeframe. Hopefully it's, it's, it's through in, in, in 48 hours. And so the devil, it need, the stories need to be written down conversationally, full sentences, erring on the side of more detail than less with punctuation. The devil is in those details. So when it comes to our wins, which p- people don't write those things down either, yeah. okay, the diamonds are in the details. So one win per page per day, right in the middle of the page, a uh, 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 two, three, four, five sentences, one paragraph of about the wins, and that takes usually two and a half minutes. Yeah. Okay. And um. What that does for kids. So I was telling the coaches this, those level two coaches on Monday, I'm like, you help someone, you help your client, you help your clients in their own personal life. They'll, um, they will thank you. Well, sincerely. It's, it's one of those things that I think like the, the value and the benefit that I see from it is we talked about this, I think a little bit last time, like you and I, I kind of, you probably got you got it a little bit sooner than I did. Like I, I waited until I was like around 38, you know, I'm 42 where I started to realize that I was thinking about things wrong my whole life. Mm. And so when you try to undo 38 years of bad habits, it's super tough. I mean, and, and so to create those good habits at a young age of recognizing that there are positive things that are going on in your life and a win is a positive thing, right? Because we camp on the, the negative things. And as a parent, I say things I shouldn't say. And, and she takes it ways that she shouldn't take it. And, and to be able to recognize that, yes, there was good things that came out of that today won't 
help you camp on the bad things. I mean, it's, it's a great way to figure that out sooner rather than later than to just think about the bad things all day long. Correct, which is what happens once the reticular activating system gets programmed. More on that in a second. So I told the, the, the coaches on Monday, you help your clients with their own personal story, they will thank you sincerely. You help their kids and they'll thank you forever. And what wins journals do, okay, 5 to 12, works at any age and the that that's that's a that's a they'll 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 get it faster than us you know that have been repping the same kind of stories and myelinating the same neural networks don't i sound smart about you know <laughs> victim centric stuff right yep. and so what happens when they get they, they 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 get in the habit of celebrating wins and it could be a big deal they could win a spelling bee they could score a goal with soccer it could be uh, it doesn't matter what the size is. They could they could um, tie their shoe. Okay, yeah. they you know get get to class on time. Anything their wins happened during the day, and 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 then when they get titled and written down, they become more concrete and meaningful, and they're easier to uh, pixelate and 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 detail in our imagination which then so the more detailed they get in our imagination and the words are the vector the words is it's the lever okay uh and and the more detailed the imagination the stronger the feelings and emotions and then what happens as they practice identifying their wins eventually they will identify themselves as a winner yep and what that does is it raises their psychological and emotional immune system, which is a big deal because there are there are there are individuals, there are groups of people out there that um, you hear this these words all the time. They're spreading hate. Don't worry about that. Okay, yeah, that's right. super low level. You know what you need to be worried about? People that are that are trying to convince you and let's take out you and put in our children that they're victims right and there, there's a there's a whole weaponized army of goons doing that and um they're good at it and their language technology is very sophisticated it's very thought out they know what the outcome is they know where to start they know how to keep it going and they know they know what the final destination is and it ain't good right and um um uh, did someone say communism? Yeah. And so um, what we – what we only if you want your children to grow up and see themselves as capable and confident and good enough. Let's just, let's just go there. Good enough. When someone thinks they're good enough, they do – they go do the stuff that they want to do. So I'm good enough to start going to jujitsu. I'm good enough to start a business. I don't know anything about this, so to speak. And I'm, I know I can learn. I'm good enough to learn. I'm good enough to be in the room with these people that, you know, um, you know, they're my mentors and not my peers, but you know, if I, if I keep doing this, then, you know, I'll, I'll get better at it. They're, they're good enough to start and they're good enough to keep going and, and they're good enough for other people to love them. Right. It's, it's just one of those things that's like super amazing that like even you just think about it. Like if, if, if you start out where the age group that you're talking about, right, they're the most um, impressionable, right? Mm -hmm. Kids are learning like she's been working on Spanish and she's like on lesson 14 and she's learning Spanish on her own and she's able to do that. Now, that's something that like if I went to go do that right now, it'd be way harder for me to figure out now than it was, you know, 30 years ago right? When we're in that age group. So they're more malleable and it, it's just, it's, I think it's a great place to start because they don't have to have 38 years of the wrong shit going through their head. They can start out on the right foot. Our language, everybody, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, when's the best time to plant a tree 15 years ago? When's the next best time today? Same thing applies to us and learning about our words, thinking about our thinking, picking up the pen, going into some of those stories that still hurt and sting um, and, and, and that are influencing our reticular activating system in a certain way. So the reticular activating system, uh, uh, apologies, Wes, I 
negation acknowledged, do not remember if we talked about the reticular activating system in the last podcast. I did 16 podcasts this past month. Um, did we, we may have, but I think that it was probably very minor. Like we didn't okay. dive into it. So, okay. This is, um, this is, this is absolutely worth our time and it helps, uh, well, there may, there may the be some people who are going to go back to the first conversation from this conversation. So it's definitely worth okay. revisiting. Okay. Super cool. So we'll, we'll, we'll enter into this with a story. Uh, 2018, I'm in Richmond. I wake up get dressed, walk out the door. I'm going to give a presentation. And I walk over to where my car was parked the night before and it's gone. Somebody had stole my ride. And, and I, 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 I looked at this empty space. It was my car 12 hours ago. And I called the police and I said, help. And they said, hold on, buddy, we're coming. And then I called my dad and I said, dad, I, this is, this isn't a joke. Somebody stole my car. Uh, I've got stuff to do. I need to come get the farm truck. And so he goes, okay. So I drive out to the farm and um, get one of my father's prized possessions. It's a 1985 Ford F-150. He bought it mint condition off the showroom floor. It's called Brown and Browner, two tones of brown. Forgive the dust, everybody. (laughs) This is Brown and Browner. (laughs) and i drove brown and browner into richmond virginia and in under 24 hours i start seeing 1985 ish ford f-150s all over the place i saw three and two city blocks and i'm like where the hell are these things coming from and most people have had that experience wes have you ever bought a car and then you see the car all over the place yeah every day (laughs) what's the car it's the same, like, it's the same, it's my work truck. Like, I love my work truck. Like, I'm a truck person, right? So, like, I want mm-hmm. this, I want this ZR2 Silverado one day. And, like, I'm going to get it. I'm definitely going to get it. But, like, I'm driving around because I have a trail boss and I'm looking. I'm like, oh, there's mine. That's the same as mine. That's a ZR2. <laughs> I want that one. That's mine. I, you know, like, that's yep. just, it's just the way it goes. Correct. Most people have, I, I bring up that story as a way to, 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 well, back into or get into the reticular activating system because most people have had that experience. They've bought a car or even the car that they want. um, Maybe they just see one commercial and they start seeing that car out and about and they're like, where the hell are all these cars coming from? That's the reticular activating system, folks. And so it's a piece of hardware in your brain that all of us have and it has some very important functions. One of them is a search and edit function. Okay. Uh, uh, as in, once it gets programmed with, uh, the, once something gets deemed as important, it goes on a search mission. In this case, it was a 1985 Ford F 150. And then, so now, now the thing goes, okay, your wish is my command. And it goes and finds more of those things. And then, and then it has to edit function. So while it's finding and identifying more of those things, things it's editing out anything that's not that so i didn't i didn't see um any red osmobiles or blue bugs or anything like that because it was it was not the thing that i am looking for and it's it's um the most famous study that i know of that uh, that, that references the the functionality of the reticular activating system and the downright unbelievableness of it that's not quite the right word um the 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 astonishing power of it that's closer uh it's called the invisible gorilla study here's a short story of what happened two social psychologists in the late 90s took seven college kids they dressed three of them up love liquid death dressed, <laughs> that's good stuff three of them up it's the best three of them up in white uh outfits So the Invisible Gorilla study, everyone, is a very famous study. You can still see the original video on YouTube where they took seven college kids, dressed them up in white, three of them up in white, three of them up in black, and one in a gorilla costume. 
and the white team got basketballs and the black team got basketballs. And they could only pass the basketballs back and forth to their 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 teammates and and um it was a one minute video. They filmed it for one minute and and asked the people that were watching it to count how many times the white team passed the basketballs back and forth. It was very simple. So they directed their attention. And then 30 seconds in, that seventh college, the seventh student in the gorilla costume walked into the middle of everything, beat his chest and turned and walked out. And that was it. And right. And then, and then they asked everybody, well, how many times did the white team, spoiler alert, 15 passes. And, and then they asked, oh, by the way, did you see the gorilla? (laughs) And 55% would be weird. 50, 50 50% of people edited it out because they weren't looking for it. Yeah. And so the question is, and I, if I, I normally ask this when I'm, talk about the invisible gorilla and the reticular activating system in the truck and the so does our reticular activating system only respond to 1985 Ford F150s and Silverados and um students in gorilla costumes or or is our language influencing how we see things and what we see and what we what we don't see and I'm here to say definitively that it is Oh yeah. It's amazing because it seems like it's, it's funny, like thinking about that. It's like your own Google, uh, tracking. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's the yeah. reality of what it is. It's like, I was searching for a rototiller the other day and how many rototillers are now in my feed, you know? Amazing how that works. Yes. Yep. And, and, and so see the reticular activating system as a lens, see it as a filter, um, see it as a pair of binoculars. Okay. It is a, binoculars and then and then you know certain words put things into focus and certain words push things back pull things out and push things in focus so um she's never there for me that right there that sentence is going to format the lens of the reticular activating system and i'm only going to be able to identify the times that she wasn't there for me, in my opinion, yep. and then um, and then it's going to edit out any times that she was there for me. So it's called confirmation bias. And I, I, apparently, I'm pixelating a little bit more. Would you like me to walk over towards the the uh, the rotor? Is happy yeah, to do that. Why don't you, yeah, let's see if that'll let's see All if right. that'll fix let's her up see a little if we can bit. Do this and. Um, yeah, and 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 it goes both ways, you know. Um, they never clean up after themselves. <laughs> I say that, right? Yep. I say that, and I'm not. I don't allow myself to see any of the times they do, and very rarely is it going to be a never, an absolute never. Okay, you know she's she's always interrupting me, or he's always interrupting me. Right. I'm I'm only gonna I'm gonna see her in a certain way. It's called halo and horns. I'm gonna put a, some some horns on her. And now she's the villain and I'm absolved of all responsibility. So we got an apple orchard out here. Oh, very nice. Super pretty. <laughs> yeah. We're going to, we're, we're going to make uh, we're make cider this year. Oh, nice. So I'm now everybody significantly closer to the router and we might have an even better connection, which is very good nice. <laughs> because these conversations are good. I've got some flowers behind me. How's that? Is that Very better. Good. Yep. Oh, the flower just okay. makes it so much better. <laughs> super cool. Yeah, super cool. Yeah, and um, you know, I've I've a woman walked in and sat down, and um, she said, you know, I've just got this, uh, I got this story going, and I've had it. My mom used to tell me all the time, men can't be trusted. And she would just she would, she would get she would get all close to me. I was just a little girl and she said, men can't be trusted. Men can't be trusted. And I would think to myself, well, why? And then I wouldn't be able to answer it at that young age. And then I would just say, oh, well, uh, you know, that's mom. And she, she's my mom and she knows everything. And so I guess I just, I can't trust men. And so she grows up and guess what? She was having trouble trusting men. 
And guess what? There are some men out there that are not trustworthy. Guess what? There are some men out there that are trustworthy. And with that lens in place, she wasn't able to identify any of them. Right. And she was like, I, I have had a couple of great relationships, but I just, I just couldn't get it out of my head that they were doing something behind my back or, you know, this is, this is, you know, she was creating all kinds of stories from that one sentence. Well, that that's the, spell. I mean, that's, that's kind of the basis of a lot of bad relationships anyway, right? Like I, we all have that friend who has had a bad relationship with every man that she's ever been around or vice versa, you know? That every single one is terrible. Well, what are you looking for? You're looking for this persona that has been built up in your head that is not the right thing to look for. So now you spend your time looking for the wrong thing and you can't find the right thing. You, you just, you're absolutely right. I heard one woman say, you know, I've had the same relationship with seven different men. Yeah. And, and that's, that's exactly what you're talking about right there. And, um, uh, and, and that, I, I'm for sure certain that I brought up the definition of the victim mentality last time. Yeah. And you know what? Let's do it again because we're, we are there once again. Right. It's, the conversation of mindset very, very frequently, if it's done halfway well, it will include the definition of the victim mentality or at least a contextualized conversation about what it is and what builds it. So the definition of the victim mentality, everybody, the victim mentality is an acquired personality trait where a person tends to see themselves as the victim of the negative actions of others, even in the absence of clear evidence, the victim mentality depends on a habitual thought process and attributions. I did it. I, I normally do a little bit slower and I already did it on the first one. That the last half of that first sentence, even in the absence of clear evidence, people can and do create victim centric stories, even in the absence of clear evidence, Sometimes people will f totally fabricate evidence evidence in their in their imagination to to uh, it's like I said it's called confirmation bias to to confirm their pre existing beliefs and the the reticular activating system is just going and doing what it's told it'll work it'll work so well for you it'll work so well against you it's yeah. mechanical it's it's too, it's 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 a calculator. Yeah. And I mean, that kind of, I think, I think this ties into kind of like some of the, um, scenarios that we talked about before. Like, um, I, I asked people on TikTok to kind of give me a couple things that, that, you know, like how they talk themselves out of situations because we do this all the time. And I think that a lot of this leads into that kind of victim mentality. Um, you know, it's, you tell yourself things, um, you know, here's, I have a couple of these and we can go through a few of these, but like, here's, Love it. Please, here's please. one from someone said it's, it's been years or it's years of being told by a man. I don't deserve anything. I'm scared and I can't the what ifs I could go on. I'm too fat. I'm not pretty. I'm not enough period. I can't get be promoted at work. I'm too old. I need more. So thinking about that, thinking about, Flipping that and reversing the way that that scenario comes about, where do you go? There's, al there's always several angles. What I would do with that in a coaching situation. So if I had an hour with her on a Google Doc, and that's how we run our coaching sessions. So we get on Zoom and she's got access to a Google Doc with questions. Mm -hmm. And I've got access to that same Google Doc and, and we get on there on Zoom and I hit share screen and assuming she's on a laptop, which is, you know, uh, common, it's, it's not, it's, we tell them to, and, and they can write on the Google Doc and I can write on the Google Doc at the same time and we're looking at it. So it's real time. It's, it's, that's actually a very, um, valuable for those of your, the, the people in your audience that are coaches are thinking about getting into coaching. That is a great way to curate your, your client's stories is to get them on a Google doc. First, well, you're first, forcing you them to put it on paper. Like you talked about being on paper Thank is you. the reality of the situation. So, I mean, although it's, you know, a Google doc, it's the same thing. It's like, now you're writing it out. You have to actually put the words down so that you can read them and visually see what you're putting down. Absolutely correct. And then you and your client are both looking at the same configuration of words at the same time. It's extremely clarifying. A, even a good coach, it, it's challenging to dialogue back and forth with a client as opposed to the 
clarity that having words written down that both you and your client can look at at the same time gives. Okay. Yep. So um, back to the Alan Watts, you know, when we learn to think about our thinking, we become alive in a new way. He's right. And the fastest way to think about our thinking is to get the words written down so you can look at them. The f- look at this. Look at the words. The fastest way to, to slow down a story, which allows you to think about your thinking, is to write it down. So I'm pretending she and I are on a Google Doc, and I would have her write out all those things on that Google Doc, and I would ask her to read them. And um, there's a real good chance, that's an understatement, that she would have an emotional response to reading them. Mm-hmm. I would ask her what the feeling is. What is she feeling? Where is she feeling it? Tens high, ones low, what number is it? Okay. And then I would ask her to identify a specific event in this current relationship or events. And you go for the big stuff. You go for the most, it's called putting the gorilla on the table. And and you get this, you you get this identify the specific events. So the time that he told her you were a fat, ugly bitch and nothing will ever work out for you. Title that and write it out conversationally, which is what most people do not do because it brings up that ouch and pain and sting. It's remember right. that th- spicy Thai dish. And so you get that on paper, you get the story written out on paper. And, and then, so you start to uh, accumulate or organize, um, curate the adult stories of a victim centric nature. And, and then from there, um, I would, I would ask her to read that and very likely because the more detailed we get, the more intense the feelings get. Right. And it's a very strong rule of thumb in the the mechanics of story because that's what we study at and lifted the mechanics of story. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not theory, not this big picture stuff that, you know, you just gotta, you end up being a stoic, you know, it's like this. And I've seen that. I've seen people. You try to outthink their emotions and feelings. It don't work. Okay. And I, I, we had this one guy on, on a, on a call and he, <laughs> this is exactly what he was doing. He was going, I take responsibility for my part in everything. And he thought that because he, he was saying those words that it was going to remediate that, that deep pain in his heart from the, the the failed marriage and it's like dude great i cool i see where you're you want to go and we, we, the spicy thai dish must come out yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the spicy thai dish it must come out you don't can't hold that thing that. in <laughs> try as you might yeah it's not that's, happening that's what people that's what people do with their emotions, dude. That's what they do with the stories of ouch and pain. And it's simply an education issue. Um, education and intent. So anyway, she would, she would, I'd have her read these stories and very, here's, here's where we go. Very likely the seed events are coming from specific memories back in her childhood. Mm-hmm. Okay. That also haven't been titled and also haven't been written out. And then once a story is written out, you four step it. And this, um, I'll go ahead and explain it. It might sound strange. It's extremely simple and extremely reliable, and it doesn't matter what you plug in there. Okay, It doesn't matter what you plug in there. You can plug a, a car accident, a dog attack, a failed business, a failed marriage, bullying, whatever, because it, it works on the mechanics of story. Okay, yeah. First things first, title it and write it out conversationally, erring on the side of more detail than less yep. with punctuation. Very important. Half sentences don't do it. Okay. General half sentences and general themes and, you know, it doesn't cut it. And so once the story is titled and written down, then you have them read it regular speed. Okay. Ask and and ask them how they feel, what the feels happen. Step three, have them read that same story 30% slower than their normal rate of speech. And what happens, what we, why we do that is because um, when people slow down their rate of speech, the breath unlocks. It starts to loosen up, and we really want that. There's a saying in the Enlifted community, good luck changing your client's mind while their breath is trapped in their chest. Yep. It's not going to happen. It's, they're they're, they're going to smile and nod, and you're like, wow, this is going really well. It's not. We talked about and that then, a little bit because breath is very important to, to a thinking process. If you're oxygen-deprived – then you're not going to 
see the things the same way as if you're not. And most people who are pissed off all the time are clinching. Correct. Not breathing. Pissed off. Correct. They're, they're clenching their jaw. Their breath is trapped in their chest. Uh, so people are like, oh, I've got really tight shoulders. I mean, oh, you, you hold your breath. You know, I, I clench my teeth. Oh, you, you hold your breath. I get really nervous. I have social anxiety disorder. Oh, you mean you hold your breath when you meet new people. It goes on and on. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's called amygdala hijack. And, and so not only is their shoulders tight and their jaws are tight and their breath is trapped in the chest, their butthole is puckered up. <laughs> I own unpuckered.com. <laughs> I've owned it for five years. I'm, I was shocked that I got the dot com. I'm like, why are people sleeping on this? It's, uh, <laughs> it's a true story. And, that's, the, and, that's the next LLC of Unlifted. <laughs> yeah, unpuckered.com. So we've got an app in the app store. Um, it's in beta. If you've got a, uh iPhone, you can download it and start playing with your words. And for the first six months of its, it, first six months of its existence, it was called un, the Unpuckered app. I promise <laughs> Dude, I it's promise. Coming. We talk, it's coming. <laughs> it's coming. Yeah. And and so when the story is kept in the head and it's vague and swirling and seemingly infinite and hard to get to, to any, you know, leverage point in it and the pictures are huge and scary, the breath is trapped in the chest. And, and so what we want to do is we want to externalize the story and unlock the breath. And so that first step, title it, write it out second step read it and if they have super strong emotions great cool uh let it happen step three read it slow so i slow my rate of speech the breath begins to loosen up and then step four is where we read the same story slow and then when we get to each punctuation we do this So it could, it could, it could, it could sound like this and that every, that ladies and gentlemen is a very big deal. Cause if you pay attention to how most people relay a story of ouch and pain and sting and woe, they're not reading it. Okay. They're reciting it. Okay. They're remembering it from memory right. and they're usually saying it quickly and their breath is trapped in their chest. So let's change up some of the components some of the building blocks of how we tell stories and see what happens. So it could sound like this. Let's pretend someone, um, uh, they, they, they start with a, an issue of, you know, I just, I just feel like I've, I've always got to be there for everybody and I take on way too much and, and I'm never doing enough. Okay. And okay. Give me an example of that in your adult life. And they do, and, and, and they write it down and we read it and I ask, well, what are you feeling? And they tell me, and I'm like, okay, well, what does that remind you of? Uh, when was the first time you ever felt that feeling? Does it take you back to a specific time in your childhood, specific theme? And half the time people go there just like that. Okay. Yeah. Another 40% of the time it takes them 20, 20 seconds, which is nothing. And, and, they, and they, well, yeah, that reminds me of when, you know, my parents sat us down, my sister and I in the kitchen, because that's where half the deliveries of, hey, we're getting a divorce happen in the kitchen. I've done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of divorce stories. And yeah, that reminds me of when my parents told us they were getting a divorce and, and then, then I have them write it down. Okay. And then four step it. And so that fourth step could sound something like this. My parents brought my sister and I into the kitchen. My mom was crying and she wouldn't look at us. My dad was emotionless as usual. He said, your mother and I are getting a divorce. You're going to stay here with her in the house. I'm going to get an apartment across town. And I'll see you every other weekend.
We just need you to know it's not your fault. My little sister is under the table, bawling her eyes out. And I think to myself, well, I guess I'm the man of the family now. Reticular activating system snaps into place and they go out and, and, and overdo it and take on too much. And, and all the stuff that I, I said at the beginning, like guys, Hey, I'm struggling with this, this, and this. And so when someone get here, it is everybody. When they get the air, they get the breath, take a breath of fresh air, get, look, get it off my chest. Before you get it off your chest, you need to get it out of your head and written on paper and you get it off your chest. It, what are you talking about? It, get it off my chest. It pressure, tension, tightness. Let's clear the air. There's language in our language that describes what happens when we keep stories in and our breath gets trapped in our chest. It, it, clear the air in the closet and the tires. No, in my lungs. Cause it's stale and stagnant. And I, I need to, I need to get into this story. Some smart part of me is like, get into the story. Okay. Right. That's the way out. The way out is in. And so when people tell the, that their stories that way, um, what, the, what it does is it, it, when we go from sympathetic to parasympathetic, when we go from stressed state to relaxation state, as the breath descends and gets in there, the emotions and the feelings come up and, um, the, the, the client story kept in the head, breath trapped in the chest picture in your face. Wherever you look, there it is. Story written down and aired out, the picture moves out. And you go from the relentless participant to the observer. That's a big deal. And you don't have to know what your clients need to think and do. It It absolves you from being an all the right answers coach or person. Those are low-level coaches. I'll say that twice. 1-800-I-got-all-the-right-answers coach. And I got all everything figured out and I'm smarter than you. That's amateur hour coaching. Period. End of story. Um, and, and so that is what I would help that woman do with her stories because telling her, you know, what else is low level coaching? You just need to stand up for yourself. You think that's going to work? You just, here's an even, here's an even better one, Wes. You just need to love yourself more. This is the thing that I, (laughs) I find so amazing about it all is the fact that, it's not what works for me does not work for you. And what works for other people is completely different. And to, uh, to just say that just to have all the right answers is not the right answer. Like you can't have the right answer. You have, they have to recognize, they have to see, they have to feel, they have to know. And that's, it just brings it out. It just makes it bop. Yeah. And, and no, no, um, no, 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 <laughs> <laughs> no one has ever calmed down when someone says, honey, you're overreacting. Yeah. Calm down. Yeah. Oh, well, wow. Yeah. I am overreacting. I do need to calm down. Thanks. That's never worked in the history of history. <laughs> and um, you just need to believe in yourself more or here's, here's another good one. This is all trash coaching. Um, just be more positive. <gasps> Wow, I never thought of that. Thanks. Yeah. No, that's never no one's ever done that. Right? It's um uh yeah. It's it's, it's it's there's better ways to help people with their stories. And so that is what I would suggest that woman do. Um and yeah. What's I think that's great, man. Question? I think that that's like I don't even honestly like the fact of that one whole scenario is great because that really addresses the rest of them. I mean, the reality is, is that every single person is different, getting it down on paper, saying it out loud, breathing while you do it allows you to see the picture more clear and have it in more focus. You know, it's like putting on glasses that when you can't see to help you identify what you, now you see the root of the problem. Now, how do you address the problem? Correct. It is, it is a tool to create space and clarity. And when people have more space and more clarity, one, they feel better. And two, they just, they, they, 
they make better decisions. They tend to make better life decisions. And stories in the head, oddly enough, take up a tremendous amount of mental real estate. They take up a tremendous amount of space. And it's never ending. They just loop. They loop and they swirl. You know, how many, uh, plenty of times, so many times, it's part of the Enlifted Method. It's one of the modules in level two. It's called options work. You know, people say, you know, I've got a, a really big decision to make. Okay. You know what me, Dr. Rocket Scientist over here says? Have you written down your options? Right. And almost always they say no. And and then I don't I rarely do I say this, so I'm like, well, that's one of the reasons why you're calling this a big decision. Okay, because because options a, a decision to make oh, and by the way, m- 98% of the time when they pick up the pen and they write down what their options are, okay, it's four options or less. It's a lot less than what you think it is in your head for sure. C- correct. Correct. Because you never get relief from the questions. Right. Okay. As long as the options are in the head, it's hard to make a decision. And then so it doesn't it, – it feels like it's 44 options. Okay. Yeah. It's not. It's I'll, I'll, I'll guarantee you it's under six. Yeah. And I, you know, I'll roll dice that it's four or below. And then, and then one, when they get them on paper, then they can see it. Then they can see it. And we turn a mountain into a molehill and maybe it is a big decision or at least in, 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 you know, most of the time it's not that big of a decision. Um, when, when you see what path you can take and it's also the same with the imposter syndrome voice in the head. It might seem like there's 555 imposter syndrome sentences going on in your head. And I, it's not 50. It is not 50. It's not 20. Okay. How how do I know that? Because I do this work for a living. been doing it for a while, 16 years full time. And I've helped a lot of people pick up a pen and get those, you're not good enough. Why would it, and we, specifically with coaching in this case, and it's imposter syndrome is all over the place, turns out. Um, why would anyone want to work with you? There's, why would in, anyone want to work with you? There's so many other better coaches out there. Who do you think you are? Um, how can you help people when you're so messed up? Um, and then, so it's the stuff that we, we, we whisper to ourselves. And then it's, it, then there's the paranoia side of it. This is stuff that we we uh, negatively fantasize about other people saying to us. So and so is a coach. Who do they think they are? And then and you just you get these. There's there's not twenty. There's not twenty of these sentences. It's just the sentences on repeat. Yeah. And the fastest way to slow that dog shit shit storm down is to write them down and get them on paper. And it's it's it just it. Well, we're breaking spells, everybody. There, I said it. Yep. Well, I appreciate you hopping back on here. I mean, this is just awesome. It's now we got a breakdown. People can have some tools to use a little bit, and um, you know, if they want to get in touch with you again, why don't you just tell us where where they can hit you up? Enlifted dot me. That's our website. It's all about our coaching certifications. The gram at Enlifted Coaches. We do a, a free class of live coaching. So we've been talking about it here, which is fantastic. And and it's also interesting to watch it run. Um, so every Tuesday night, 6 p.m., I get on there and pull people on and we work stories. And I explain what's happening as we go. So I coach and teach simultaneously. Very fun. Tuesday night lives. And and then we've got a podcast called Get In Lifted, where coaches talking about words. And you know, we got a lot of coaches listen to us and a lot of people not in the coaching game listen to us because they just want to learn about their words and their stories and and get better. Yeah, and they're very powerful. And we have some we're going to have a, a few more guests coming on here that are coaches and we've had some really good ones already. Um, you know, you need to check out next week's episode. Well, last week's episode <laughs> is going to be the Savage Megalith. She is awesome great like I'm we talked about that. yep it's it's a good one it's a good conversation i the nuggets you know they come in they come after too so that's what i like about this new patreon thing where they can hear a little bit more about what's actually going on because it gives me a time to kind of loosely talk and 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 us to have a conversation that might be a little bit more meaningful towards like me in general but give some people some really good information so 
We'll have some more Enlifted coaches for sure, and uh, I'm sure Mark will be back. But uh, thanks again for hanging with us. My pleasure, Wes. Thanks for listening, everybody. Yep. All right, everyone. That was another great interview with Mark England. If you want to hear some of the snippets or the things that we talk about after the show, go join the Patreon for as little as $4 a month. You can help us upgrade the show, get some better cameras, get some better moving into the Shaping Success studio here in a couple months, which will be awesome. Got to get that thing set up. But great information. And uh, until next time, I challenge you to find the shape of your success. We'll be right back.